Do we need data standards in the era of large language models? It's an article on the NEJM AI journal, and uh, it's got Josh Mendel as one of the co-authors, the creator of Smart on Fire. So let's dig in. Abstract. Data standards for health information ecosystem have played a critical role in enabling software integration across healthcare enterprises for data sharing, analysis, clinical research, and public health. However, the ability to use large language models to dynamically extract unstructured data into a standardized format for downstream use possesses a question about the future of health data. Namely, what role do data standards play in the era of large language models? And do we need data standards at all? So if you followed me around, I have talked about this in the past. I'm Dr. Siddharth Ramesh and we do everything health IT related uh, here on this channel. So do we really need data standards and do we really need health IT standards to begin with? And that's what this article tries to answer. So I will give my comments and I will, uh, you know, take you out of the article now and then to sort of give you a little bit of background and context. Uh, but yeah, data standards for health information ecosystem have played a critical role in enabling software integration within healthcare enterprises and across organizations for data sharing, analysis, clinical research, and public health. Concrete data standards such as HL7 Fire dictate how health information technology systems must format, structure, and process data. Now, if you've been following what FHIR is and how FHIR works, uh, and you know you know my take on uh, the FHIR profile prolifer proliferation and how you know uh, some other standards like OpenAir is potentially a better format to globally exchange data, uh, but FHIR has had its you know, success. It's definitely being used uh, across the world to at least transmit data within the national context. So this is definitely true. FHIR provides an international consensus-based set of data models, resources, and APIs covering administrative, clinical, financial workflows, and other healthcare domains. So now, technically, it's not right to say it provides an international consensus-based set of data models. So these resources are more of a framework on top of which you build these profiles. So I would still kind of um, go on the side of, okay, yep, that's true. And you do provide these APIs, but again, it's up to a particular implementation guide or a profile to implement those set of APIs. But yep, they are there. And, uh, you know, you anyone can extend on these APIs and data models and create their own implementation guides. Okay, so cool. That That is, that is there, right? So without these standards, electronic health record systems would be siloed without within institutions and be unable to integrate with the laboratory systems, decision support knowledge bases, and electronic uh, prescribing interfaces that support patient care. Uh, now, this, uh, yeah, I definitely agree with. In fact, without uh, sometimes the government intervening and actually requiring these standards, it will almost be impossible to get data out from uh, these proprietary EHR systems. So standards such as FHIR enable integration of innovative functionality into the health record, streamline large-scale analysis and establish accountability for transforming diverse source data into consistent formats. And there's a figure one. Let's take a look at this figure, shall we? <coughs> so you have raw health data from uh, systems like pharmacy, clinical data, radiology, and you manually have pipelines uh, that are able to send it to a formal you know data standard like open air or fire and then you have the applications that are then used on top of the data standard to do whatever right this is a traditional approach that uh, we talk about a lot here and we want this clinical data repository right so Let's just go a little ahead into the diagram and see what they are trying to say here. So in the new era, they say that, okay, there will be raw data that will also, you know, be manually curated and it will probably go and it will be the same. But then this new kind of data, for example, clinical notes and wearable device data may be driven by LLM pipelines into the data standard. And then we may have applications that work on the data standard. So we'll first transition into something that looks like this. And then finally, I think what they're trying to say here is 
okay, you may not need this data standard at all. You just have, for example, you have an expert in the loop, you have an LLM, and you have your application directly, take it in the format that the application wants. And here, I think there still seems to be a figment of this data standard uh, uh, re repository. And again, in the end, there is this custom data interfaces and an LLM sitting between them, converting between these custom data interfaces. Okay, back to the article. However, the adoption of standards also introduce costs for sure. Uh, definitely, it does introduce a lot of cost. And uh, they include a slower development process requiring a formal consensus that is inflexible to changing data landscapes and stakeholder needs. Limited data coverage focusing on core use cases and inaccuracies caused by mismatches between the standardized formats and the underlying data structure in use by data providers such as EHR systems. Uh, this is 100% a real issue, right? Like so you tend to take time when you have to decide on anything that has to be standard, like let it be a fire profile or a fire resource or an open air archetype. These things take time and use cases and like real world data providers can't wait for standardization uh, providers to catch up and model their use cases. So what they usually do is they just like run ahead and they implement their own version of a standard. And then we look at it and there is an hour of, uh, you know, request for comments and then they make it into the standard. So this is 100% true. And for example, we are also seeing this with like, let's say the US core fire profile. Uh, it does not include things like continuous glucose monitoring, for example, but this is a very needed use case. So people are pushing for it now and they are then standardizing this. Doesn't mean that this has not been done before. People have already been transmitting continuous glucose monitoring data for a very long time now. Uh, so let's go. In this issue of the NEMJ AI, uh, so this is another article that introduced the possibility that the translation from free text EHR notes to fire may be automated with the use of a large language model. I think this was fire GPT. Um, they used LLMs to extract fire resources in a semi-automated fashion from a previously published data set, showing that LLMs can generate fire resources with better accuracy than existing large language processing pipelines. I think that's a given. Like if you're comparing uh, LLMs and the recent state of the art, and if you don't know yet, Llama 3.1 recently released and they have like this huge model with like 400 billion parameters and that's completely open source. It's beating GPT-4, it's beating Cloud 3.5 at literally most tasks and that's open right now. So you don't have a dependence on even GPT-4. So large language models comparing that with traditional uh, NLP processing pipelines I don't think it's even fair. This work is an important step towards reducing the burden of extracting unstructured EHR information to a common data model. The ability to rapidly translate across data models using automated methods may have a very large impact on the ability of clinical enterprises to adapt to changing data standards quickly and consistently. Yes, I think so. But there is also a problem with how people usually represent things in an unstructured format, okay? So sometimes it's obvious what somebody wants to represent, but sometimes uh, even two humans may disagree on what a particular unstructured text means in terms of the semantic meaning. So when this happens, and we have not gone beyond human level accuracy for GPTs, it's still very much, you know, at human capacity or like slightly below the expert's capacity, how do you expect a GPT or a, a how do you expect an LLM to convert something that two humans disagree on, right? And uh, an example that I could probably give is like if you have a text that says um, a person was bit by a dog is kind of scared of water right now. What do you is is that a diagnosis of rabies? Can you infer that, or should it just be the history of present illness or the HPI is? A person was bitten by a dog and is now scared of water, right? Uh, so humans tend to disagree on this. Should it be automatically diagnosed as rabies or since it wasn't clinically explicitly stated in the unstructured text, should we not, right? So how are this work hints at an even more radical future? 
LLMs such as generative pretrained transformers for this like GPT-4 I don't think there was any need to expand on this uh, show the cap- capability to dynamically modulate data presentation and structure enabling a new more flexible data for data communication powered by semantic standards rather than structural ones will this capacity reduce or even eliminate the need for data standards or common data models okay so again I I have my reservations here so I don't know what you think but I I'm not sure. I don't know if this will be able to figure out the nuances that humans have a hard time figuring out themselves. And that is often the case. Two people don't agree on what a particular unstructured clinical note really means semantically, even when we have forms to like convert that from. So do we even need data standards with LLMs? Despite the historical and current importance of formal data standards, the success of Fire GPT, and uh, yeah, it is Fire GPT, raises a, a new possibility. Could we have a world without data standards at all in which LLMs such as GPT-4 translate data formats on the fly? In this world, rather than requiring all data users to route through a static centralized schema, which may not well represent their use cases, data providers could structure their data in a way that best reflects the richness of their content. This is absolutely true. Like you definitely have people on the edge who are actually developing the systems. They can represent richer data with their particular context and their content in their databases. The problem is that they will also get confused on what something really means right like so for example i've seen a lot of times where a prescription uh in in the sense of an ehr uh, just means a medication prescription and you just have a list of drugs uh, but you have some ehrs which kind of treat a prescription as the complete entry that a patient uh, you know they, they, they include um, the diagnosis what happens to the patient uh, you know what are the procedures that were done to the patient in that particular time their previous history they include all of that and they call that a prescription right so maybe llms are smart enough to identify that oh okay this is what the ehr vendor really means when they mean like prescription it means everything but we have a hard time understanding this like we don't want to just look at a data map and then we don't want to look at a database and just assume uh, that's what it means we usually go back and we ask the ehr vendors like hey what does this really mean before we take on uh, any work to really convert this to a format like fire data consumers could structure their analysis so that it best reflects the nature of their task both could rely on LLMs to dynamically restructure the data based on semantic meaning to fit the needs of the end user. I get where they are coming from, but there are challenges. So let's see if they address such uh, challenges. Such transformations could be performed on the fly with LLMs directly reading inputs and producing outputs, or they could be performed by LLM authored translation programs, uh, which could be analyzed for correctness, version controlled, and otherwise managed like traditional data transformation software. So this reminds me a lot about agentic workflows. Like you don't just have one LLM that's converting it. You can have another LLM that's like um, translating and another LLM that's like version controlling and like looking at it and verifying it for correctness and so on. Right? You can definitely have that. Or you can just have a traditional human in the loop who's verifying this. These approaches would enable automatic transformation of data across different health data systems, aiding not only in observational research, but also in EHR integrations and migrations. Automated abstraction of clinical registry information and a shorter feedback loop for turning research results, such as a clinical, uh, such as clinical risk scores, into workflow integrated clinical decision support systems. Interesting. I think CDS or clinical decision support has the highest um, yield in terms of what it can do with LLMs. And I definitely think something like this is very interesting. Right? In addition, the flexibility offered by LLM aided data translation would enable a much more open competitive ecosystem of clinical informatics tools as tools could be designed without a specific EHR or data format in mind and be usable across 
many institutions with little or no specialization required okay i get the point here so you you think so a tool would for example be built on uh, the schema of its own choosing and you can have these llm pipelines that then convert from for example fire to this particular schema or this uh, for open air to this particular schema or the ehr's own internal format to this particular schema llm aided data translators also need not operate in a vacuum human experts working with these tools in correctness critical settings can iterate with llm agents to optimize and refine the translations in a process similar to but orders of magnitude faster than traditional data integration projects okay this is an important uh, highlight i think I, I would definitely like to highlight this point here so what this is probably going to look like is there are going to be human experts who are probably going to feed in a lot of prompts and they are going to explain what the structure of the data is both in terms of the source data format and the target data format they are going to explain the context behind these data formats they are going to give it a set of rules maybe to follow so that you know the problems with uh, if you see a patient with a dog bite and who's afraid of water do not automatically classify it as rabies just only do it if it is explicitly stated so these could for example be a few short examples that a human expert may want to work on and optimize and correct the these llms um and yeah i mean this if anything i think this uh, is probably the highlight of the the whole article uh, this vision is particularly appealing for clinical research efforts relative to patient care Clinical research can sometimes tolerate increased latency, data mapping errors, and unstructured inputs because these can be mitigated in downstream curation. Okay, uh, <laughs> you have a lot of uh, research interns just sitting down there and like crunching this data away today. Anyway, so definitely aiding their task using LLMs uh, makes a lot of sense. Uh, research efforts often begin by ingesting data using formal standards and then curating and mapping these into community based analytic uh, repository models with the curation effort amortized across many downstream projects a slight degradation in translation performance is more than addressed by the ability of llms to more quickly and economically liberate clinical data for research purposes okay let's take a moment to understand like what the problem is here so when you have data in healthcare systems uh, before they send it out to a research organization or for a research project they usually have a tedious process of like putting this data together curating it and converting it to for example another data like uh, omop another data format like omop and this involves significant effort uh, and again you probably need to think of about uh, anonymizing this data making sure um, it's no one can identify a single patient from this data set and this, it's a lot of work that goes on okay so it's not just de identification you need to think of uh, like differential privacy so a bunch of things that go on before they can get this data out now what the authors claim here is that the degradation in translation performance is more than a slight degradation in translation performance is more than addressed by the ability of llms to more quickly and economically liberate clinical data for research purposes so now what they're just stating here is that okay we don't care that the data quality is kind of bad it can still be made up by the downstream uh, it can we can fix this using an army of interns i, I assume and they can do that as long as they have access to this data to begin with so as long as you can use llms to just like quickly and economically liberate this clinical data it's still a win although these benefits sound compelling in a world in such a world is such a world even possible can we rely on llms to perform at the necessary levels in critical in a critical setting such as medicine and even if we can would they be too costly or inefficient for real world use cases well this part about too costly or inefficient for real world use i think it's just a matter of scaling and it's just a matter of things becoming cheaper and cheaper and cheaper right like if we take for example gpt3 when it came out it was really expensive but 
then GPT 3.5 Turbo came out, cheaper. Then now we have GPT 4.0 Mini, which is like much smarter and much cheaper than the GPT 3.5 that we had before. And the way it seems to be scaling is that it's, it seems to be 100xing in economical uh, value. So I just think it'll be time before we consider LLMs to be something like Python, where, yeah, we know that it's slow, but I'm not going to write C code. And I'm not going to like, you know, and again, like C++ is probably another abstraction over assembly, where people are like, I'm not going to bother writing assembly anymore. I'm just going to write C++. I know it's like slightly slower than assembly, but I, my productivity is more important than a machine's ability to interpret my code. Uh, same with Python, right? So we speculate that we likely can rely on current or near future LLMs to do an adequate job on meaning on a meaningful subset of these tasks. So now what subset is a question for sure. Furthermore, we view chat uh, fire GPT as one of several key milestones on the path towards the semantic data future. Okay, a hybrid approach. We expect that we will still need formal data standards to some degree. We would not expect them to fully fade from widespread use, nor would we advocate for such an eventuality. Now, again, this is a very good uh, point because like there is a saying that if you have some technology that has lasted for the last 10 or 20 years, then there's a good chance that it will last for another 10 or 20 years. Uh, so HL7 V2 is still being used for majority of the translations between different systems. We have Fire, we have CCDA, but like HL7 V2 is still king in a lot of uh, fields. So, I mean, I don't think it will ever replace standards uh, and formal data standards. And in a way, it may even help the large language models prompting uh, exercises to have these data models defined in these formal data standards. Uh, in high throughput controlled applications, optimized pipelines relying on validated data, uh, validated traditional standards will offer key advantages in speed, robustness, and cost over more dynamic, less controlled LLM driven systems. For sure, you're going to be much faster if you're using uh, something that's coded. Uh, but again, this also brings uh, this other alternative approach where an LLM can dynamically generate code and it just keeps updating this code every time it sees something new. And this updated code is kind of like a compiled version of an LLM's output and you are still able to execute this with as much speed and robustness as you would uh, uh, the LLM's logic. But you are also able to now like validate and see that and it actually runs directly on the machine uh, as traditional software. Furthermore, technical systems will need certain levels of data standardization to communicate at all. This is like 100% true. Like if the government doesn't push EPIC to expose patient information as fire, they're not going to do it. Simple as that. Even if data uh, are ultimately routed through LLM aided remappers, so you do need these technical standards and standardization just for API level communication. How do you expect uh, anyone to like communicate anything at all if you don't ask them to do it in a proper, in a particular format, right? So it's more of a human aspect here. Finally, LLM based agents will likely make liberal use of standards, empowered tools for predefined data analysis through structured pipelines or for data transfer to subsidiary tools or services. Yeah, so they'll convert it again and based on the particular schema of a particular tool, you can then convert it from a particular standard, okay? A hybrid model can bring the benefits of standards to bear on a more flexible dynamic world of data powered by LLMs. I think what they're talking about here in terms of the hybrid approach uh, is basically this, in which you have the standard data format in the middle, uh, but then you make custom data interfaces on both sides, right? And you still have this like standard data format. Uh, but it'll be hard for data standards to really keep up with every single use case. Uh, so let's, let's read on. I think it's almost the end of the article. A hybrid model can bring benefits of standards to bear on a more flexible dynamic world of data powered by LLMs. In a world in which... LLM-based agents aid in data translation to and from diverse schemas and concept vocabularies can offer significant benefits to the research and clinical communities. 
this transition is inevitable as LLM's uh, capacity grows and it will further highlight the importance of the proactive research by Lee et al. This is uh, Fire GPT. Okay, on how these new capabilities can be leveraged and what problems they may present for our health systems. Now. Definitely uh, an interesting article. Uh, what do you think? Like, let me know in the comments down below. Do you think we need data standards at all in the era of large language models? If not, how many of you, uh, you know, are ready to change your practices and what you are doing today? How will you change it to, um, you know, fit this particular model? Um, uh, it's quite interesting to see how things go by. And uh, so thanks for watching and uh, just let me know what you think in the comments down below. Uh, if you are interested in health IT and health IT standards in general, uh, we conduct a webinar every month. Uh, do check it out in the description down below. Uh, we usually have limited seats and we try to cover a lot of uh, interesting concepts in the duration of the webinar. So join us if you like and thank you for watching.